Thank you very much, Renuka and Paulus, for setting the stage for the next uh, plenary discussion this morning, uh, which relates directly to the issue of curriculum. In fact, it's possibly one of the most significant developments in higher education for several hundred years. Uh, it's the proposal for undergraduate curriculum reform in South Africa undertaken by the CHE, the case for a flexible curriculum structure. And I want to welcome um, our special guest and a very dear friend of the Teaching and Learning Office, uh, Professor Ian Scott, uh, who is currently Director of Academic Development and a Professor and Deputy Dean in the Center for Higher Education Development at the University of Cape Town. He has, over the years, served on various teams, task teams, and undertaken research on, on various national bodies, including the Ministry of Higher Education, the Council on Higher Education, National Commissions on Higher Education, uh, and the National Business in Institute. He's been the member of the Education Ministry's reference group for academic development since the year 2000. Um, more recently, he has been a central figure on the Council on Higher Education's Curriculum Reform Initiative. Uh, he was coordinator of the, res of the uh, research for the proposal and provided robust intellectual leadership for the development of the proposal. Uh, and this, I would imagine, uh, would be the culmination of his lifetime dedication to higher education development. But I asked him this morning what he would consider his most significant achievement. And in his characteristic coy manner, he slipped this into my hand, his business card. It says, my biggest triumph, winning the beginner's section of the Western Province Latin American Dance Championships in 1968. So now we know where the smooth moves came from in designing this document, Ian. Ladies and gentlemen, Ian Scott. Um, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Renuka, Rabi, to be here again. This is an uh, institution that is very close to my heart. It's such an interesting one as well. Um, I was never a dull moment at UKZN. Can I use this mic? Is it, uh, am I audible at the back? I was wondering how on earth my talk would follow Paulus's. And I just find that there, there are remarkable correspondences going on here. Sometimes in the world, things seem to pop up uh, spontaneously in, in different places at, different, at the same time uh, that reinforce each other. So, and I think we will see as we go along just what that means. First of all, though, the topic of this conference, the, the re-envisioning, I think could not be more appropriate at this time in our development. We know enough now about South African higher education uh, to recognize that despite the real areas of excellence that we have, it's actually in a critical condition because, and this is really important to us, it is not meeting the needs of the majority of our people either the majority of our students coming in or the majority population groups, however you like to see it. It has not adjusted to our realities. And that's quite extraordinary in this time. So something decisive has to be done, and this does require re-envisioning at different levels. I've been struck in this conference at how even a very, at a very micro level there is thinking going on about how to do things differently. But there's also some big stuff that has to get done. Because if we don't do some of the big stuff, a lot of the, of the more micro critical stuff is going to get lost. So in our task team, 
we've been addressing this question in relation to the very, if you like, unexciting area of the curriculum framework. It doesn't deal really with issues of content or canon, ideological uh, debates and contestation. It's something more basic. But I think for that very reason, something very important to allow for other developments. So it's a very concrete set of ideas and proposals, but we hope reasonably theorized. I uh, was, of course, very involved in the task team, and when I'm speaking about the report, I'm obviously speaking about the, the joint work that was done. But some of the ruder remarks I will make are entirely my own. So I will not hold the other task team people responsible for it. What my plan is today um, is to go very briefly, if I may, through the case for this reform. Why should we be doing it? Because many people are familiar with it, but some are not. And especially in relation to our visitors from further north, they are not. And I think with res in respect for that, I want to go through the, the case quickly. And by the way, I do believe that what we've been doing here has relevance to any society where there are fundamental inequalities. And that applies, let's face it, to most of us all over the world but especially in the developing world. So I hope that they will find, you will find relevance. So the case briefly, and Rabbi, shout at me after 15 minutes, please. Violently, mathematically, okay, <laughs> in that way. <laughs> That's right. Um, if, if we can do that, and we want to, we've called this a conversation or a discussion, we really want to try and get uh, people engaged and speaking about the issue. So if I can go through the case, and I'm going to ask people, uh, if you've got real issues with the case that have to be dealt with, that's fine. But if we can avoid a whole lot of discussion about the case yet again, that would be nice. Um, to get on to looking at, let's just say, for the argument's sake, the case is made, then what are the big issues that come out of that. Now, that's a tricky distinction, but I'm, I'm going to ask if we can do that. So the second part will be really concerns that have already been raised all over the place about this in the month or so that the report has been out. And then some really important implications, most of which I think are positive for this. And um, I would like to do a little bit of input, and then let's throw it open. I've got many more slides than I will need, because if... Uh, if there are issues that I won't cover, I may well have something on it for the discussion. Is that okay, Ravi? Yeah. Right. Right. Um, can I just get myself some water? Excuse me one minute. The dinner was too good last night. Um, right. So what is it that we're trying to do? Very simply, actually. We are needing to substantially improve the graduate output for all sorts of reasons. And it's in numbers, but numbers are not enough. It's about quality. It's about the attributes of those graduates for our needs and for the needs of the world. And critically, equity of distribution of the very important benefit of higher education, which we don't have at the moment. And that is for powerful reasons, colleagues. It affects all kinds of development. And this is not to deny the importance of schooling before, but unless we get high-level people in the society, it's going to affect all forms of development, not only economic. And then, critically, it's essential for revitalizing the, 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 higher, the whole of our education system. We need good graduates from all of our communities to do something about the bad state that we have got into, right from pre-primary onwards, right through. And then also to minimize this unsustainable wastage of our talent that is going on in the country, as you will see. So, re-envisioning is a very important part of it. And I think my argument does link with what Paulus and others have been saying. First of all, sorry, I should say that at the heart of it, it's that we t need to take ownership of our own system, understanding where we have come from, valuing the good part of where we have come from, but taking ownership of it. 
And my common phrase in this is that we need to design our own system, starting with the framework, in terms of, in accordance with our own realities, very important, not somebody else's, not what ought to be, but what is. Secondly, in terms of our needs as a country which is part of the world. And after Paulus's uh, talk today, I want to add in accordance with our own passions because I've never been seeing that before in that way. And I think that is crucial. To touch the hearts of all of us is going to be extremely important in this matter. It's a big job. We've got to start somewhere. So... Uh, we have to understand that the origins, and by the way, I talk about the framework, the parameters of the curriculum, which are hugely important, as we shall see. Uh, they actually were inherited by us in the colonial period 100 years ago, nearly. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, necessarily, but the, the system itself must be judged on its own merits. But it is odd, isn't it, that it was designed in a different era for a totally different student body. Homogeneous, small, generally privileged. And actually, we've changed very little of it since, surprisingly enough. So here's my point. To design our system on the basis of our own realities, and I want to add needs and so on, um, because there is clearly now a mismatch between those realities of ours and our needs and what's coming out of it and our traditional inherited structures. And those things now affect the majority of our students and of our people. It's not a minority issue. That's the critical thing. It's time, I think, really time now, to, to keep what is positive, and there's a lot positive. We've inherited good standards, etc., etc., good ways, good science, etc., but to move beyond those factors that are impeding, unnecessarily impeding, our students' progress. Why would we not? And this proposal of ours focuses then on establishing an enabling framework. I think you will appreciate, without my going into any deep theory, but the frameworks, to a large extent, determine what we do, what is possible. If they, and they can either be enabling or constraining. I think most of us will experience our current frameworks as not enabling. And we'll see more of that kind of thing in, in a short while. So we've got, to, we've got to produce one that is enabling. And this does not in any way uh, downgrade the importance of the pedagogies of everything that goes inside that framework. But we are arguing that the framework is a necessary, if not sufficient, condition for moving ahead. So the proposal, in bold terms, is we have a flexible curricula stru curriculum structure. This is the, the, the outline of it. And it's brutally practical. We have to increase the duration, in some way or other, uh, of our core degree and diploma programs by the equivalent of a year, as the norm, because it's the majority that would now benefit from that. And in practical terms, we have to get funding for that. And I'll show you how we can do that very readily. It's, it's perfectly affordable. And in South African parlance, 120 credits worth of provision. Real work for us and for the, teach for the students. We also, however, in order, because of our own diversity, have to allow people to move at their own pace a lot more than we do now. So we do not want to hold people back for whatever reason, if they are able to get through a degree program successfully in a shorter time, that must be possible. And the system must be designed to do that, and we've shown that we can do that. But we maintain, or even slightly improve, our existing outcomes and exit standards. That's the broad <coughs> parameter. That's where the rubber hits the road. We have found this to be feasible and affordable and that it will really improve things. And interestingly, more cost effective than our current very inefficient system. The case that I want to whiz through is based on four pillars. Unsustainably poor performance and wastage of talent. 
this is a hard one, no prospect of the school system or the FET college system improving sufficiently to enable higher education to continue business as usual with a decent degree of effectiveness. Why the third pillar? Why, in all of this then, why a focus on curriculum structure? As I said, as a necessary condition. And what are the implications of all of that? Those are the four pillars. The performance patterns, big deal, one slide. Participation remains very low. Sometimes, uh, well, you know, just to give you an idea, the figures don't matter particularly, but we are around 17% gross enrollment ratio, whereas America is in the high 80s, Finland is 90, South Korea is 93, or something of that kind. We are way down, and it's racially skewed. We still, colleagues, have a 4 to 1 ratio of African to white, other way around. Okay? Uh, the access problem has certainly not been solved. But the, down, the upside of that is that given that we are taking this small proportion, only about 10% of the youth of our majority population groups, they must collectively have high potential to succeed. We cannot say these are rubbish students. It doesn't match up with that reality. In terms of potential, it's an elusive concept, but we have to say we should be able to do well with the top 10% in terms of achieved performance of our youth. Yet performance stays so stubbornly poor. Just a few headline items that we probably know. Only about a quarter of contact students leave out distance education in UNISA, graduating in the time they are supposed to. So already, the great majority of students are taking four, five, six years, N plus one, two, three, et cetera, to graduate when they graduate at all. Half of our intake will never make it, even if we take account of people coming back into the system later, staying well beyond six years. Half will not make it. Half of the top 10%. And the net effect of all of this, the maths is not very hard, only about 5% of coloured and African youth, by the way, people have misinterpreted this to say 5% of students, that, thank heavens, is not correct. But the media got it wrong, and the students. But only 5% of the youth population is succeeding. That's unacceptable. So we have what we've called a low participation, high attrition system in stark contrast with other countries where there is high attrition, where almost always there is also high participation, like the US. And it affects the majority of our people. And what this points to, colleagues, is that attrition on this scale cannot be blamed on the students and their deficiencies, nor even can it be blamed on us as the, the teaching staff. It's a systemic, it has to be a systemic problem. Our people are not more stupid than the rest of the world. Our teaching is not all that much worse than the rest of the world. So why do we have these problems? How do we account for them? Well, again, a huge topic, but to go ridiculously dangerously through some very big topics. Of course we recognize the significance of poverty, material factors, affective factors, uh, institutional culture, of course. But the task team has concluded, and many others have too, that at the heart of the matter are learning-related issues. If they were not, why would we be complaining about our schools, about this, that, and the other? It's not all about how students feel or what's in their pocket, although it's tough to work properly when, you, when you're hungry, of course but there are deeply embedded learning-related problems in our system. And that's not surprising, given where we come from. We often talk about student under-preparedness, and of course it has a meaning. Renuka and uh, Rabbi's book challenges it very nicely. Because under-preparedness is always a relative concept. You are under-prepared for something. You may not be underprepared for something else. So the, the better way of looking at it is actually the mismatch. 
between what the students bring with them and what the institution has traditionally expected. Which one is right? The problem is not right or wrong, is it? It's about realities. It's about what we do. And the key thing about, and it's not the only thing, by the way, by any means, is the school higher education articulation gap. It's not the only thing, but it's a very important thing. And a gap is a crucial concept because it can be closed from either side. And it probably should be. It does not absolve either side from the responsibility of trying to close it. Given that education is a continuum, and as we were chatting about yesterday, we all like to blame the level below, and the preschool teachers blame the parents, who then blame society and the internet, okay. all of that stuff. So what practically can we do about this, and what sectors are going to do something about it? Not hope or ought, are. Again, dangerously superficial. But here's a figure that you need to get your heads around, I think. We've calculated very simply that if higher education were to be able to continue business as usual and be res relatively effective, getting not a 50% dropout, but a 30% uh, dropout, 25, 30, why not? We would need 100,000 additional well-prepared students, meaning those who can graduate in N or N plus one years. 100,000 every year now. What are we getting at the moment? 40,000. So tell me, colleagues, where are those additional, additional 100,000 well-prepared people going to come from? It's not going to happen in my lifetime from the schools. And OK, you can say that's not very long, but you know what I mean. <laughs> so again, brutally uh, short to say, we don't see the prospect of that happening. There are many things that the school system has to do. It has mass correctly massified hugely. We've got deeply embedded problems. The FET college sector is struggling to meet even its most basic objectives. So there is overwhelming evidence, not that we should not keep the pressure on, but that we should not rely on improvement outside of ourselves to solve the problem for us. And if we are relying on that, then we have to have a pretty good idea that it's possible to do it, and we think it's not. So therefore, I say to all of us, administrators, leaders, academics, we have a choice to accept that status quo as somehow inevitable and just go on with losing 50%, or to say we can actually do something about it and act on things that are within our control. That curriculum. Okay. Do do that well. And that's our choice. And I am sincerely hoping, and our choice needs to be made now, I am hoping that this higher education system will have the integrity to make that choice favourably. Third point. Rabbi, am I pushing my left? Yeah. You've got three minutes. For the, before the end of the case. Before the end of the case. Right, thank you. I'll be quick. So why then focus on curriculum structure? Well, the framework sets so much. It, it really does determine in many ways what we can do, and I've said is either enabling or constraining. And I've pointed out before that it's been inherited a long time ago, and we should keep what is positive but remove things that are impeding us. And then I want to ask the very important question, why should we not change those things? Who is benefiting from the status quo. Patently looking at the numbers, it's not the majority of the students, nor the majority of the population in this country. Who is benefiting? It's an old question, but it's a very good one. So, the key thing is that in our current framework, we do not have enough space. I prefer to think of it as space rather than time, because at UCT, we only teach 26 weeks of the year anyway. We could do more. It's not a question of just years. It's space. So what are the things that we know we should be doing and would like to do but can't do because we don't have space? We cannot deal properly with the secondary higher education articulation gap. 
We make assumptions about what students can do when they come in, not on the basis of reality, but on the basis of what ought to be and what it takes to go from point A at the beginning to the graduate. So in mathematics, if you're going to get to the point in three years that you have to be at, you have to assume that students already know calculus when they come in because you don't have time to teach it. The sad problem is that they don't. So when they don't, you get this mismatch going from day one. And you can't fix that up with a bit of add-on support. The second thing is that we know very well we've got to put in a whole lot of work on developing, if you like, skills, uh, literacies that are fundamental to supporting learning. They're also good graduate attributes, but they have to be there. Language issues, huge. Uh, you know, not just spoken English, but academic use of language, etc. And we know we've got huge difficulties. We don't have time to deal with them. A, a very important point that has arisen in recent times is the question of transitions within curricula. Sometimes transitions in actual knowledge domain. So in engineering from basic sciences through to engineering sciences and design. They're different ways of thinking. And students are differentially prepared for them. And if we can't do something about inducting students through those transitions, they will stumble. Have you thought about why it is that so many students fall out high up in the curriculum? And finally, we would like to be able to enhance our curriculum to get better graduate attributes and to meet the needs of the contemporary world, but we don't have time to do it. We at UCT have been trying to get an, an African language into our law curriculum for I do not know how many years. Surely it makes sense for a lawyer to be able to have some kind of grasp of at least one African language. I'm talking now about those who don't have African languages as their mother tongue. But we can't put it in, because the big question is, well, what would we take out? What's more important? Therefore, and this is our big statement, these structural obstacles to improvement cannot be addressed effectively without increasing the normal duration of the core programs. We need the space to do what we need to do. And finally, as I said earlier, we need to be able to deal with diversity. One size fits all doesn't work for us. And moving from one rigid three-year type structure to another rigid one is not going to deal with that. It's controversial and difficult, but we think that it's very important to start to introduce flexibility, which is a, the way the world is going in any case. So it allows for differentials in starting points and therefore assumptions, progression paths, and duration, but no compromise on everybody getting the same exit standards at all. We do not want first and second class programs. Uh, just to say that we did commission some very excellent exemplars. I won't go into them now, but I do commend them to your attention in the report, those that are of interest to you, because they tested out these ideas in practice and found them workable. Now, we have looked at the implications, but that is the case. Can I ask briefly, for, for, for frank opinions, I'm interested to know what is in people's minds at this time. Are people saying, yeah, it sounds like a good idea, the case is quite good, but actually there's no way we're going to do that in this country. We too, we've got change fatigue, we've got this, that's too expensive, whatever it may be. That's what I'd like to hear about. Very briefly, right? Just quick, a couple of quick things. There's Mark. Will you, will you feel the question? There's Mark. Um, Delia, Michael, Samuel. Okay, we'll take those two for now. Thank you very much, Ian. I just want to start off by saying that I'm really excited. I'm really excited to be. Um, I think at the threshold of a very exciting time in South Africa when there's going to be so much more focus on teaching. I think teaching at higher education is, is about to change drastically and I'm really very excited about that. And I, I look forward to it and I look forward to many, many, I think, interesting discussions on how to get 
uh, teachers to be, oh, sorry, how to get teachers to be more passionate, educators in the sciences. I come from mathematics and science, and I think we're about to enter a very, very exciting era. Fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you very much, Ian. What's on my mind? Is this a stretch of what we already have? Um, is, it, is it just simply expanding the models of existing pedagogy? Because then we're going to end up with the same problem. Uh, or is this an opportunity to fundamentally reconceptualize how it is that higher education learning happens? So that's on my mind. Thank you. Um, yeah, and we, we, we've come a long way. We do a lot of work together. I'm, I'm, I like what you're doing. I've been part of following this, this process. I have a report. I've read through it. I've marked all the key points in it. And you know I have a vested interest because it actually filters into the studies that I've done right. before. However, I have a big problem. And the problem is um, the CHE is dealing with this massive elephant. And it's a huge elephant. We have to deal with it. I would have liked to see a scenario where there is, um, I don't know, a collation, an integration between what's happening in other layers. You spoke about blame theory. You spoke about blaming. At the moment, I see it in the HRD Council, and I've been charged. I, 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 I chair a technical task team tasked with fixing schooling. I'm in a very precarious position. I find myself constantly at loggerheads with Njimu Tsekha, and I would have liked to see the processes taking place in HRD being linked with the processes taking place in, in CHE so that we don't have these inconsistencies that are taking place at the same time. So I'm, I'm, I, I like what you're doing. I'm excited at what we're doing. But I, I think coordination should have been very critical at this stage. Then we would have two things that are all moving in as a seamless flow. Thank you. Thank you. I'll three, go three. Uh, thank you. I will take Delia's as a, a very encouraging comment. Um, Michael, th uh, that's a huge question. Are we just going to have business as usual spread out? Well, clearly that is not the intent because it won't work, right? So how do we stop it? Well, first of all, I would like to be positive about it. I think that um, we can, by creating different incentives and space, make it possible for more creativity to come in. There are a lot of good people around. I mean, you think of the whole AD world, but way beyond that, who want to do good things, who are, I mean, at, at this university, you're doing some amazing things. I've heard Renika speaking about plans that you've got, fascinating things, but you can't do them at the moment. You can't. So in the first instance, to unleash creativity will be very helpful. But what about those who are not interested in being creative and are just going to say business as usual? I think what we are trying to do here, Michael, is to make that extremely difficult to do. Very practical measures. So, for example, this question of the 120 extra credits. So the degree, an ordinary BSc, will be 480, not 360. Okay? So people actually have to create curricula with an additional 120 credits. Okay, that's very important. Have to account for that in HEMIS terms, otherwise they don't get the money, and in SACWA credit terms. So it will be quite difficult simply to, I mean, you know, there is an accreditation process here. The CHE will be looking out for it. The department will be looking out for that kind of behavior that would be counterproductive and completely acting against the spirit of the proposals. The second thing which has caused a lot of controversy and con will continue to do that is that in order to enable some students to go through more quickly, we have to get into what is in effect an RPL process, recognition of prior learning, well, that the Americans do all the time with a system of advanced credits. If you have done the learning and you are able to demonstrate it, then you don't have to do it again. Why would you want to do it again? So let me take a risk, a very crude example here. Uh, because I think the, the recurriculation is not only about changing the first year. It's about thinking about the curriculum as a whole, which will be, without even being very fancy, will be such a liberation. 
to get, to get away from the horrible step changes that we have that have uh, arrived over time with us and so on, but to take sensible, very basic, ordinary curriculum development principles and put them into practice. We can all do that. But let me take the maths and to say, um, if you've got a decent now new maths one to four to get you to the end point of the degree, full maths major, um, maths, the new maths one is certainly not going to be the old one, but it's certainly not either going to be just a foundational maths course. It doesn't have to be. We can do better than that. We've always had to add those things on. We can do better. Now, a student who has done really well somewhere else can demonstrate sufficient knowledge of the new maths one to gain exemption from it. Not getting the credits because you haven't done the work, but you are exempted from it. And the powers that be at the CHE accreditation all have told us that's fine to do. So the curriculum will have to be designed in a way that this kind of RPL can be dealt with. And that will again be uh, a further blockage to simply spreading the stuff out. So I can only go over this very quickly, Michael, but just to say, and I was in fact going to cover it, which is why I'm spending time on it now, because it's an important topic, I will tick it off, um, that that is an issue that has been thought about very seriously. And the other related one that would, would have been on the same slide is to say that we have to allow for some institutions being quite cynical and using this opportunity as a marketing tool. Can you imagine it? Come to us if you want a three-year degree. Go to UKZN, yeah, it'll take you four. That's going to be more expensive, all of that stuff. You can imagine that, sadly, because this is going to affect public and private, right? Right across the board. It's the law. And that will be uh, discouraged in much the same ways, that we have to have accreditation, that uh, there are going to be very strict rules in the same way we have strict admissions policies, an extension of that into the RPL type of sector. So there's no way that an institution is going to be able to get away with Mickey Mouse criteria for, to enable students to quote unquote accelerate. I'm sure there's not a full answer for you, but it's what I can do at the moment. Um, my colleague at the back there, who gives me so much trouble, a very close colleague, and I've relied a lot on his work. Thank you very much. Um, I think, can I just say that I heartily agree with you, but something has got to happen to get this moving. This is the proposal, and this is the early -ish, well, stage of the consultation process. So this is when we have to raise these points and say, why can we not do them? If we had tried to get everybody on side in agreeing before we started this, our fear was that nothing would ever happen. So this is why the task team decided not to consult before the report, but to do the report, to put the whole argument together, set out the implications, and then let everybody sort it out. I think I should move on. Yes. Colleagues, I know there must be other questions, uh, and if there are dark thoughts in your mind <laughs> about how you're being conned or something of this kind, I would love to hear about them. I wouldn't actually, but I need to hear about them. <laughs> so just to say that we have looked at these things and I will, if we get time, I will pop into some of them. But just to say that the task team has looked at these issues and it's in the report. Academic standards, no, we're not going to, to lose them. Uh, autonomy, no, we can't do anything about that, it's in the law. Uh, growth, I will come to, and critical matter of dealing with inequalities. But before I do any of that, everybody worries about the money. So we just have to do a little bit on the money. Because of course the intuitive position, which is a good example of poor use of mathematics if you don't know the whole picture, is that changing a three-year to a four-year funded degree will add a third of the costs. For those of you who said a quarter of the costs, back to school. Okay. <laughs> so. We've had a hard look um, at this. And the financial projections have been extensive based on very excellent work done by Charles Shepard, who did all the number crunching for the 
uh, funding formula task team, the Ramaphosa Commission, that's about to publish its findings. So it takes everything into account. It's quite remarkable work. And it will be on the web for everybody to, it might be already, everybody to scrutinize. And just a very quick set of headline numbers to say efficiency, which comes about through effectiveness, works. So we could introduce this without spending another cent, but it would mean an efficient system that produces the same number of graduates for a smaller intake. Now, we don't want to do that politically. The system is committed to growth. Green paper, NDP, etc. Huge growth. How are we going to do it? But it's only 2030, we will say. So probably not going to do it. Okay. But nevertheless, growth is critical for all of this. So the system has to not question about whether there will be more money needed, because there will be. Growth costs. It will always cost more to produce more graduates uh, in, in overall numbers. So the question is not so much that, but how much more? And here's the first figure. Uh, it just happens to be these strange numbers that come out. Um, that if we have the same intake as we have now, the, our proposal, which is called Scenario 1, will produce 28% more graduates for only 16% more cost, conservatively estimated. Whereas Scenario 2B, which is the growth scenario, which assumes that preparedness in the system will go down a bit, because the more students you have, the, more, the higher the proportion of underprepared students there will be in the this, in this system. There will be an effect on performance. It's modestly uh, assessed, and that would be, require a whole 38% more. You can see that the numbers are going the wrong way, and that's what happens with growth. 28% more graduates, 38% more cost. That's what will happen. And if you get to the big numbers at the end, it's terrifying. Cost per graduate is derived from that. Our proposal will actually save 10% cost per graduate. Whereas the putting more students in at the beginning model will cost 20% more than what ours would do. So the cost per graduate, definitely a benefit. Just to give a sense of the numbers, if you look at what the government would have to fork out, steady state, when you get four cohorts in the system, four different intakes that have entered and are flowing through the system. The average annual, annual additional subsidy that would be required would be the small number of five odd percent, not much by department standards uh, of what we are spending now for another 28, 30 percent graduates. And finally, over the full cohort period, if we take an intake go right through, the additional cost um, of going through the simply pushing more students in to get the same number of graduates out, you'd be spending 1.8 billion for that cohort. It's not trivial. So the waste would be exacerbated. Let me show you the figures. There's a nice little graph. That graph shows, it's in the report, it shows you, just worry about the top line there, that is the unproductive use of subsidy, let's call it crudely what it is, waste, which Mwaketsi, well, you know, listen to me again, we estimated years ago in the billions, these figures have confirmed that idea. This is for one cohort, and the system would have four at least in it normally. So you look at the status quo there is about 1.2 um, billion, because those are in millions, at the moment, per cohort. Four cohorts, four to five cohorts, nearly five billion every year, not coming to fruition. You will see how it dips. There's still a lot of wastage in the system because we can't assume anything like perfect performance. It's a modest assumption of improvement, but you see how it dips. And look at what growth does. If you don't change the system to get more effectiveness, growth goes out of, over, the, over the graph. Terrifying. 50% more if you look at the scenario 2B, which is the figure at the end. 
So I don't think that the people who have put the Green Paper or the NDP together can possibly have costed the growth because this is what you would see. Where is that money going to come from? Has your subsidy also been cut recently? Yes, thank you. Point made. Yeah. This is very crucial, cost to the students, counterintuitive, if you like. We've been able to calculate that the student body, on average, would have the same outlay as now. How can that be when they're spending more time? Well, at the moment, they are already spending more time. That's the point. And you'll see the numbers in a minute. Okay, a lot more time, and the worst thing is that many students are not graduating at all. So they lose their investment. And that can be after three and four, you know the stories, people going out with tens and tens of thousands of rands of debt and no degree. Some students could well have a higher outlay if, for example, somebody who might have gone through in three years is incorrectly placed and ends up doing four, that would cost. But that can happen for a whole lot of reasons. I don't mean to minimize this, but it's not the worst deal. The person will graduate. And a far greater number would pay less, actually, because they will graduate more efficiently. Or more importantly, achieve the qualification instead of dropping out. Look at the graph. That is the numbers, uh, the proportions and so on of students who graduate in the regulation time, n plus one years, in plus two, and then those who don't make it in that time, most of whom will never make it at all. You can see, colleagues, where we need to put the effort. The students on the left can continue to graduate in the regulation time. No reason why they should not. It's the others that we have to improve, and particularly the one on the right, to get far more of those students grade. That's the waste, and it's huge. Academic staff resource. I know you've got no interest in this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Okay. <laughs> the growth scenarios would all, on the current formula, all of them, would generate enough additional subsidy to, co to enable us to maintain the current uh, student-staff ratios. But the drag on the fiscus from the different models would be very, very different, as you'd appreciate. So again, scenario one only needs 14% more, whereas 2B would treble the increase. Okay? So the, the chances of getting the additional subsidy, formula or no formula, out of the system would dwindle with continuing efficiency. So we would probably find ourselves with much bigger workloads. We have also looked into, I'm not going to go into it now, the need to improve student-staff ratios because we have dropped a, a lot in recent years. I can't go into the figures now, but again, the same principle applies. It's very expensive, but it would be least expensive if you have a more efficient system. Overall conclusion on affordability, I'll leave you to read on your own. And I dare you to challenge it. If you have dark thoughts, speak them now, because um, we want to be able to refute them. Yeah, but seriously, the figures are very thorough. <coughs> they stand or fall by the assumptions. But I think the assumptions, <coughs> pardon me, are the assumptions are not at all unreasonable. They are on the conservative side. Now. There are, just to say, we recognize, I'll go through this very quickly, we recognize, of course, that this is not a trivial thing to do. There would be important implications for the institutions. There would have to be a period of quite intensive curriculum and course design. But not as scary as people might think. We are used to some of this. All institutions have had foundational programs of one kind or another. All. So we've gained experience. And actually the people who've designed those might come into their own at this stage with the expertise they have, they have gathered. So, but it's still difficult, and it's going to take effort that academics will not really want to give. We know that. Um, also, this issue of placement, of being able to RPL yourself into a higher level is going to take serious work. But we think that can be done. And of course, the ongoing development of effective approaches, which we are doing already, but struggling to do at the pace we need to do, 
Nothing changes, but we hope it will be given extra impetus. As far as the state is concerned, what we are pushing for is a dedicated unit, a bit like the merger unit, if you like, although the mergers were so controversial, but something to facilitate change and to have a pot of money that can help institutions over a transition period. And finally, we recognise the need for nationally coordinated professional development, and I wish Witty Green and Mandisa were still here because we want some of the teaching development grant, just a small top slice to go into something of this kind to enable us to mobilise the skills we have in the, in the country and pull in a few more. Palace, don't go anywhere. Okay. Um, to be able to help us with this transition. It's, it's, of course it's demanding, but it's not impossible. And colleagues, we have to do something. Nearly done, Ravi. I think I, w I want to just pause there, actually. What about other co any comments now? Because there are many issues here. Thanks, Professor Scott. I was wondering, um, existing access programs at universities <coughs> around the country, how is it envisioned that these will tie into the new, the scenario one that is being proposed? Oh. Sorry. <clears throat> Thanks, Prof. Scott. Um, mine is more a question of policy. Um, I might be getting this wrong, but there is, seems to be an apparent contradiction in the public policy on higher education. Because if you read carefully the, the Green Paper, the Green Paper on Post-School Education and Training, it actually implies, I mean, it, it's actually quite explicit, that actually we should invert the current numbers in our system. That the higher education, the university sector, has actually got about a, about a million students plus minus. And that in effect, to achieve the kind of growth targets that we want to achieve, that's what's implied in the policy. We should actually invert those numbers and have those million students enrolled in FET colleges and the 400,000 or whatever in the university system. By the way, the apparent contradiction then ex um, extends, or ex um, yeah, extends into the NDP, which actually the NDP on the other hand says, well, the country needs to have more PhDs. Um, not that you need more students enrolled at undergraduate in order to have more PhDs, but these apparent contradictions in public policy on higher education what is your comment on, on that in light of the fact that it seems you're implying that we need more students in universities? Okay, the last question there from uh, Lumkile. Uh, thank you, Ian. I guess what I wanted to raise is that uh, you have come with a good proposal, but then I think we're dealing with a multi, it need a multi-pronged strategy. One is that uh, you have taken aspects that government can control or can influence, which are the curriculum and other aspects that you are asking for. But we have not looked at the critical issues that uh, this problem presents to us, which one of them is the racial dichotomy between performance of white students and black students that your data shows, which shows that there are problems within the institution. Therefore, that's one of the areas. But the other area is that in planning, I have some challenges with it because we've just gone through the HEQFS um, issue of aligning our programs. And then all of a sudden, there must be this kind of thing. Therefore, how is it going to be? When is it going to be introduced? And what's the time lag? Like? Colleagues, uh, thank you. Um, our time is almost up, and I know there are many more questions. But I do want to try and deal with these three because I think they are, they are very important. First of all, in terms of existing extended programs, they would be phased out because this would do the same thing but for far, far wider numbers of students. Something would undoubtedly be lost in the process. There are some wonderful extended foundation programs around which depend on uh, to, well, not depend on, but they, they include very important relationship issues, communities, and so on. Unfortunately, that model can only apply 
to about at most 15%, one five of our students. There's no more money, there's no more space to be able to do it before the tail starts to wag the dog. Okay. And that's simply inadequate. The vast majority of the students who are failing now are in need of that kind of support. And we again analyze this in terms of numbers in the report to show who would benefit from this, and you can see that it's the majority coming through. So they would be phased out, and indeed the money for them would help to fund the new structure. Tough on, but of course the people, the, the staff working in those, their stakes go up because there's a, a now a much bigger need for teaching, sensitive teaching, expert teaching at that level. It becomes mainstreamed, which is what we've been wanting to do, and is the logic. Secondly, the policy contradiction, I don't think that you're right in, in saying those numbers. The, the, there is a talk about the inverted, changing the inverted pyramid to get bigger numbers of people into colleges, but that still implies considerable growth in higher education and massive growth in the colleges. So we're talking about three to four million in colleges and still in the Green Paper says 1.5 or 1.6 million in higher education and the NDP says a similar figure, they're not the same. But there are hugely ambitious growth targets. It will fix up the pyramid, but it's not by reducing higher education. Okay. Um, finally, the, 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 the multi-pronged strategy and so on. I think that, and, and the equity issue. I mean, a lot of thought has been given into this. Clearly, there are many things that have to be done. And this, I want to say it again and again, this proposal does not imply any less need for improving pedagogies, this, that, and the other, for not at all, but it's saying it can help with that. It's a necessary step. But also, and I want to make this point, if you do a, uh, an analysis, so we've got evidence of an empirical kind from extended program analysis and analytical evidence that says, in itself, this change of structure can help, even if the teaching isn't great. You've got to assume a decent curriculum, maths one to four, okay? Because it changes the assumptions that you make about the students when they come in. Your maths one does not assume that people know calculus. And that in itself, even if the calculus is not brilliantly taught, makes a huge difference. And we have seen that in program after program after program of the extended kind. Okay. So it's not that you're just doing it and waiting for everything else to happen. It makes a difference in itself. Nearly done, Ravi. I just want to, this very critical issue of equity. The whole point, colleagues, of this is to improve equity in race and class terms because it gives all students a much fairer chance of getting to the outcomes. At the moment, the people who are least advantaged in the system are those where the, the system pretends that they can get the degree in three years, but it creates, it, it carries the seeds of its own downfall inside it for these very reasons that we've spoken about. It, in, as a wonderful phrase from, you, from uh, Renuka, we are constantly navigating failure because it's fail first all along the way. We are saying, and people taking the extra time anyway, let us take that extra time and put it to good use, not a fail first operation. And I just want to say that this applies also at institutional level. How can it be that we can assume that an, a rural institution taking in extremely underprepared in that sense students without fantastic teaching resources but the same time period, how on earth do we get those outcomes with all those variables? It's impossible. And we are seeing through good research that that impossibility is showing up. It's just the system is giving in. So to have an, a proper allowance, even though it's not the best, but the additional allowance of time to get up to the levels that we want people to get up to can only help at the institutional level where at that rural institution, 90% of the students would be on, no question, maybe more, 
90% would be on the new norm program, the new four-year norm. Whereas at my institution, that would come down, but interestingly, not all the way down. We reckon that it could be easily 50-50. And by the way, the other big issue is racial representation. People worry about those early couple of years. The new maths one would have a higher proportion of disadvantaged students, most of whom would be black, no argument. But that's the price we will pay for our past. And the whole point is to get equity into the higher levels. So year two will be hugely more equitable than it is now. And the graduating class will be far closer to equity of representation. Thank you.